Hello everybody, welcome to a Wizard's Journey version of the Starter Game in Middle Earth Collective Card Game. Hopefully I made this to help people learn and just have fun doing it instead of trying to read it. Later on I'll go on to card descriptions, card mat sets, generally just everything you need to know and if there's anything I forget to mention, I'll eventually add a forum page or something like that to it. And if not, just look into the rules. There's Pretty highly detailed and uh, it's been a lot of work on it. Hope you enjoy this. This will be a long trip, so you better go to get some snacks, go to the bathroom now, since it's gonna might take a while. Hopefully eventually I might add a just in the description so you can jump ahead to know exactly what it is. It depends off I actually get around to it or not. But let's have some fun doing it anyway. To start out, we'll start talking about character cards. Character cards are what you use to go around, get items, fight things. It's who you are and who you know. So each each of the character cards are usually typically light blue. The wizards happen to have their own color. Gandalf's gray, Palando and Alatar are typically blue, and, or size purple, how you want to look at it. Ragath is brown, and Saruman is white. And once you go into ring race, they usually get red and darker, but we won't mess with those right now. You can learn those on later. To start out, this particular Gandalf card is one for his challenge deck. That is why there's a small letter E in the top of the right corner of his image. Each of the challenge decks have a unique letter to indicate which card goes to which deck. As always, with, at the top of the card is the card name. With characters, they have the left of its name happens to be where they usually put the marshaling point number. For wizards, they have a wizard rune instead of the marshaling point since they're not actually worth anything. To the right of the image is his direct influence. It's a little black hand with a little tin inside it. Each character that has influence usually has it in this hand. It controls how much they can control for people, for factions, to do things with. On normal cards that aren't wizards, they also have a little white head that has a number in it. That is their mind attribute. It tells how much many influence points it takes to control them. Right under the image is his skill and his race. He happens to be a warrior, a scout, a sage, and a diplomat wizard. These, these skills come into play later when you're trying to use specific cards that require a certain skill in order to be even be able to be used. So they're very helpful to, to know which cards are which skill. Right under the skills and the race, there's a small number that's the random value number. This is only generally used if you don't have play dice and it's kind of irritating to use. So whatever you draw, that happens to be the what you roll basically. Right under that is the card text. Every wizard card in their set usually has the word unique in it. That means there can only be one of that on the field at a time. So if you have a particular card, your, play, your opponent can't play that same character unless he wants to influence it away or it goes off the board at some point. Wizards happen can are also can only be one, but in the play deck they can actually have up to three of those cards in the play deck. Along with the unique, there's usually a unique card text that indicates something they can do or get a bonus. It varies on the card. For Gandalf, it happens to say, Plus one to all of his corruption checks, which is very helpful, and may tap a test to gold ring in his company. Right below that is the lore. Each card has a lore on it. it mostly is a small excerpt from the books or notes, mostly give an idea who this person is or what this card means or what it's referencing to. And right below that is the character's home site. The character can only be played at Rimdale or their home site. If a wizard's already been played, the wizard has to be there in order for the character to be played, either at Rimdale or at their home site. Sometimes there are instances where you can play where you can play the character besides with the wizard, but it's best if you have the wizard there. It just depends on how you want to play the rules. There are some characters though, like hobbits, that can only be played at their home site. Meaning, unless they're in their starter company, you have to go get them. It's kind of irritating, but that's how hobbits are, I guess. Lower down the card on the bottom left is his prowess and his body. The six indicates his prowess. That means how tough and how fight ready he is to be able to kill something. To the left is his body. That's a 9. He has, happens to have the, one of the highest bodies. This, in order to kill the character, your opponent has to roll higher than a 9. Tying a 9 usually won't do it unless a specific card says if he ties it, he can be discarded or whatever. But typically, if you roll it, you'll be fine. To the right of that is the artist. Each of these artists usually can be associated with Middle Earth. A lot of these art you see for Middle Earth is, also happens to do it for the cards. To the right of that is the corruption modifier. Usually on most characters, there's nothing there. But there are a few characters like Gandalf that get a modifier. Well, if you get a plus modifier, that means whenever you make a corruption check, you get to take one marshaling point away. If it's plus, 
if it's a minus one draw of corruption checks, that means you get more corruption points. So it's typically good to have characters not have a lot of corruption points or have positive modifiers to help you out so they don't, well, die. There's also various other forms of character cards, usually if you're playing as a ring wraith or a balrog or a fallen wizard. Those are unique, different cards for different sets. Ring wraiths usually have a lot of, well, meat shields, basically. They are non-unique orcs and trolls and people you can play that can have multiple of the same identity. And fallen wizards are basically the same thing as wizards, so they have additional content on them. I've never actually messed with those. They're kind of hard to find, so they're kind of hard to pl harder to play with. But what I've heard, they're pretty fun to play with. For now, I won't go on into that since it's not dealing with any of the starter set. But later on, I will add more to the site so you can see how to play minions if you want to play as the bad guys or as a fallen wizard if you want to just kind of be out for yourself and not want to really help anybody. But for now, we'll go on and move on to the resources. Now we have moved on to resource cards. These cards are things that help you in the game, whether items or short events or things that just help you not, well, die. But since for practical purposes, I'm going to go on and use a item card. If anyone's known the movies, you know what Glamdring is. It's Gandalf Sword. Anybody can get in this game and get a hold of it. Starting off, as with all cards, the card names at the top. To the left of that's the Martian points. Glamdring has to be worth two Martian points, so it's pretty good of a sword to have just if you don't want to use it as a weapon or just to get points for it. The, right under the leafy image is what type of resource it is. Since this is an item, it says major item. It's a specific type of item. There's greater, minor, special. Each site has a says what kind of item can be played with. The card text, since this is a unique sword, there can only be one. You can only have one, and if you play it, the opponent cannot get it unless you somehow lose it. Whether you die or discard it or he steals it from you. And after unique, there's sometimes the word horde. This item is a super special item that can only be taken from a dragon's horde, meaning a site that has a dragon on attack like Lonely Mountain, or pretty much anything with a giant lizard that's trying to kill you. So better bring some meat shields, and you're probably going to lose them trying to get this thing. <laughs> it's going to be well worth it. And also, it says a weapon. Since this is a weapon, it means it can be used to stab things with. Luckily, with this one, it gets a plus three man prowess to anybody that holds it to a maximum of eight. Maximum of nine, if it happens, the hazard they're fighting has to be an orc. The lore right underneath it actually is pretty much the same as the character card. It just tells what kind of it is, and hopefully you actually know the reference. Below it, at the bottom left corner, is the modification to the Brody or the Prowess. Since it's a plus three modifier, it gets plus three Prowess to whoever holds it. It doesn't matter if you're a warrior or what. As long as you hold it, you get three plus three Prowess. To the right of the artist... And to the far right is the amount of corruption points it's worth. It happens to be a, be a 1. So it's a good item to have on people to just bulk them up and not die. But the more corrupting points they have on them, the easier it is for them to be corrupted. So they can either be discarded or be killed. Normally on resources, during the card text, it usually tells a specific thing it does, like a spell or whatever. Usually, you can once you read it, it will tell you exactly what it does and when you're allowed to play it and... If there's any other modifiers, you can usually look it up into the rules and it'll say under these circumstances you can play it. Sometimes they do change the text, so there's several different editions of the same card that's been updated. Now we'll go on and move to hazards, the big nasties of the game. Now we'll move on to hazard cards. These cards are used by you and your opponent to try to, well, kill each other and just try to generally screw each other over. As with research cards, there's also long events, short events, but they're primarily used as creatures just to try to, well, eat the other person. As with all cards, as you heard before, the top of the card is the card name. To the left is how many points the monster is worth if you be able to kill it. So typically you want to try to kill as many of these things as you can so you get more marsh points. And they can't play them again on you once you have them. To the bottom, to the right of the image is the regions they can be played. Whether it's Shadowhold, Coastal Sea, Darkhold, Wilderness, Runes and Lairs. I'll go on later on exactly what little circle means what. But right there it says which sites and regions they can be played keyed to. Some cards can actually be played to specific regions or specific sites, but it's usually said in the card text what it is. Right to the right bottom of the image is where the classification for the card is. This happens to be a creature card, so this is a hazard what you can be played on. Right on where the card text is, it says what kind of creature it is. There's drakes, orcs, plants, men, different other hazard cards can be played key to these people, either give them bonuses or what to cancel them. It just, what classification creature it is. It also says how many strikes it is and how many attacks it is. Generally, each 
hazard creature card is generally one attack, unless it says so otherwise. The strike means each strike can only be taken by one character, unless it's another card modifies it, as with everything else. Right below that is the lore, the setting, what it is, there's usually some really cool creepy ones if it's a specific kind of creature. To the right of that is the random value, and lower down on that, if you actually see that it's card set, each card, as I might have forgotten to say earlier, it says what card set it is. Sometimes it says on the round border, which is gray, each some sets have different colors, whether it's a challenge deck or a promotion card. Usually those general colors and that little symbol tells you what it is. But you don't generally have to worry about it unless you're trying to find a specific card from a specific set. To the bottom left corner is the prowess and body. Usually hazard cards only have a prowess, just how tough and monstrous they are. They're usually pretty hard to beat unless they're... If they have a lot of strikes, it usually means they have really low prowess. It means there's just a lot of fodder to throw at you. Typically, if there's a body on the hazard, that usually means it's a unique hazard. Sometimes there are creatures and other hazards that have body. They're just usually tougher. But if you can kill all the strikes at the prowess and the body, you can get a lot of marshaling points for it. And once you kill it, it's gone for good. They can't play on you again since it's dead. Usually these are worth a lot of points, and they're more likely to kill the opponent's characters, but they are typically harder to play. As with all the other cards, the artist is at the right bottom of the card, and we'll go on and move to sites. In the middle of the car collectible card game, there are two types of movements. Region movement, which is just going from region to region, usually you can only go three. It's for more advanced players, so you don't have to go constantly back to Haven at the end between turns. And there's a starter movement, like what we're going to do in the starter game, which is just from you start at Haven, go to a site, go back to the Haven, go to another site. Mostly this keeps you from dying very fast, but it's usually just easier to use. For the, if you want to use region movement, it's usually if best you have a map or actually the region cards, both of which I have included in the site where you can download them. But for this, we're going to just going to use the site cards. I'm going to show you two different site cards, a Haven and a normal site. I'll start off with the Haven. The Haven I'm going to show you is Rivendell. This is the site where you both players start playing, where you heal characters, where you play characters, and generally just where you come back to from your random escapades. To the right of the image bottom is the region. This is usually some cards, hazard cards can be played key to regions, but generally if you're at a Haven, you're pretty safe besides corruption cards, unless it specifically says so. But for the starter game, it's don't have to worry about it. To the left of the name is the little icon of the star is a haven. Later on, I'll go on ahead and show you a list of what each of these little region icons mean. There are two sets, one for just the regions and one for the sites. But I'll go on and show you that after I finish showing you the cards. So on typical on a haven card, there is only the lore and the site pass to other havens. For example, the site past to Lorien, which is generally where everyone goes, to the Wilderness, a Borderland, and two more Wildernesses. While site pass from Grey Havens is a Free Domain and two Wildernesses. Right underneath that is the lore. As you know, it's just to describe what the place is. On bottom left side of the card is a little rectangular box with two other small boxes inside of it. The top darker one with a reverse two on it, that's how many cards your opponent is going to draw. On the bottom is how many cards you're going to draw when you move. You have to at least draw one card whenever you move, but you don't have to draw up to the amount it says on there. I typically do since I need more stuff, but later you're going to discard once you reach the side anyway. As you know, to the right of the card is the art. As always, it's in, well insanely beautiful. I really enjoy it. Now we're going to move on to a normal site. I'm going to show you the Lonely Mountain. If you've seen Hobbit, you know what it is. The top left of the card is the icon that says what kind of card it is. This happens to be a Runes and Lairs. Typically, the Runes and Lairs are where dragons would be played. It usually has dragon all attacks where you can play the horde items like I mentioned earlier. But to the left of the image is the site path. For normal sites, this is where all the regions it says it moves through. So if you want to play the site's either type of region, you can look there, but also you can follow along on the map, which I advise even if you're using starter movement to show which regions you are, so if you play anything that needs a region, you know which ones to go through. On the bottom le right image of the card is the region it is in, and usually on all site cards that aren't havens, they have at the very top, it says the nearest haven. For Lonely Mountain, it happens to be Lorien. So if you're playing starter movement, in order to move to this site, you have to start off at Lorien. So you have to move from Rivendell to Lorien, then Lonely Mountain, back to Lorien. 
For underneath that, it says the playable items. Usually on this site, it says major, minor, greater, and a gold ring. And some sites actually say special information, or it can be only typically played at that place. On ally cards and other things you can play at them, it actually says it on the card which site you want to say, so it doesn't necessarily say it on the site card. Usually most sites have an automatic attack, so they sometimes have one or two. This one has a dragon. That means it has a hole, a dragon hold where you can play certain special items. It says how many strikes it is and how many prowess. It usually doesn't have any other modifiers. Occasionally it says it on there for detainment or certain thing, but it usually only applies to when you're playing as minions. Underneath that is more lore. And to the bottom left is also the same kind of thing you have on the normal other Haven cards. How many cards you play, how many cards you draw, I mean, and how many your opponent draws. Usually, it's good to have as many side cards in your side deck as you can, even if you're not going to use them. So if something messes up or you die and tap, and you can use other cards. It's generally good to have a lot of what you're going, even if you never go. You're not restricted to how many of side cards you have in the decks. When moving your characters around Middle Earth, with every region you pass through as a unique region type, with coastal seas being a waves in a white circle, three domains is a white castle in a white circle, the borderlands is a half white, half black castle in a circle, while wilderness is a tree in a circle, the shadowlands is a slash ca white and black castle in a white circle, and finally dark domains are complete black castles in a white circle. Now we're going to move into site types. Each site has its unique type things can be played at, just as same with region types. Havens are unique as in they're a white sun. This is the only place you can heal, so this is the unique site where most hazards cannot be played on you. A freehold is a a freehold is a plain white tower. Border hold is a white and black tower. Ruins and layers is a ruined black tower, and a shadow hold is a slash white and black tower. With finally dark hold coming at the end with a complete black tower. Another two symbols that might be key to know is the mind symbol and the direct influence. The mind is a white head. It's on the character cards. Whatever numbers in this head depends how many mind or direct influence it takes to control them. And the direct influence is a black hand. Whatever numbers inside there is how many direct influence that character has over other people and factions. That is all the card descriptions that you pretty much need to know. Later on in the game, I might actually mention some other cards like Corruption or when I get around to it. If you have any more wondering about the cards, you can just look under the general rules. I might eventually add a surge part of it. It depends on if I get around to it. But generally, the cards say what they do. And if you're curious, just look into the rules, as I said. And now we're going, going to move to the next phase of how to begin the game. There are six phases in each turn. The first phase is untap phase, where you untap and heal your characters. The second phase is where you play characters, rules, and company, strengths, and store items, and enact the site you're going to this turn. A third phase is long event phase, where you discard the long event cards from your previous turn, like hazards and resources, and you can also play new long event resources for your turn. The fourth phase is the movement hazard phase, where you draw cards from the site you're going to, play hazards on the opposing player, and discard the cards you no longer need in your hand once before you actually enter the site. The fifth phase is the site phase, the phase you can play items, allies, factions, you can influence characters, factions, and items from other players, and deposit items. You can even do company versus company contact, combat when you're having a wizard play against a ring ring. The last phase is the end of turn phase, where you discard the cards to get reach back to Haven. The first thing you need to do in order to get ready for starting the game, besides having the decks and the dice, is having the right playmats to learn where the cards go. There's three playmats, one for Saruman, one for Gandalf, and one for Sykes. Go on and place the Saruman mat in front of you and the Gandalf in front of your opponent with the sight card playmat in the middle. Make sure there's enough space for with your hand to lay on the table, extra characters, and the hazard cards and other cards you can play on the table so you don't lay them on the playmat since they're already indicated around the playmat which cards should go. While you do this, you also go on and play the, your character counters right in front of Rivendell. To begin the setup for Saruman, you have to play Gimli, Legolas, Pippin, and Elodon on their respective places. Then put the Dagger of Western S under Legolas, and Elven Cloak under Pippin. After you finish placing your characters and their minor items, move the March Month Punk counter to six, and then you draw eight cards. Albrecht of Bright Mail, Blot, Risky Blow, Wards, Wolves, another Wards, Ghosts, and Aroused Minions. And with this, you're finished setting up for Sauron. Now to move on to Gandalf. 
For setting up Gandalf, you need to place Aragorn, Boromir, Kili, and Merry on their indicated spots on the playmat. Then place Shield of Ironbound Ash under Boromir, and Elven Cloak under Pippin. After placing the characters for Gandalf's company, move the Marshalling Point counter to 6, and then draw 8 cards, which start with Dodge, Men of the North, Lucky Strike, Tempering Friendships, Concealment, Burt, Orc Raiders, and Orc Guard. With this, you've finished setting up for Gandalf and are prepared to start the game. And whenever I say Gandalf, I'm referring to your opponent. Before we begin the game, we're going. I'm going to want to have it set so Gimli's plus against orcs and any other characters that have a plus modifier against orcs is going to be ignored. So if you see that, don't worry about that. We're not. We're going to ignore this part for the game. Since this is a starter game, we're going to have the marshaling point cap be 20. So once you or your opponent reach 20. Then the other person only has one turn to try to beat them or tie them, and then the game's over with whoever has the highest martial points after that turn. So to begin the game, usually you'd start with the untap phase. This phase you would untap the character from sideways to right side up, or heal the wounded character who is upside down to sideways like tap. But since we don't have any, we're going to move on. This is organization phase, since we don't have any player characters move and we don't feel like actually rearranging our companies, we're also going to ignore that for now. We're going to move on straight to the movement phase. The main point of this game is you want to get marshalling points. The best thing to do is getting items, playing factions, that thing to do. Right now you have Halberd of Bright Mail in your hand, so the best place to play that would be the Borrowed Outs. So you go on and move your co your company counter from that is blue to from Rivendell to the Borrowed Outs. N now you next need to draw. On the card it, at the top, on the gray part of the bottom right part of the card, is where the opponent draws, and the below that is how many you draw. You draw one. You happen to draw Dunlemons, a kind of faction. And your opponent draws two cards, which is Orc Warriors and Aroused Minions. Now your opponent can play Hazards on you. You can only play four since you only have four characters. Normally, Hobbits are only worth half a character. But since you only have one, it rounds up to four. He's going to begin the game by playing Bert. is a unique troll key to the wilderness, and he has a prowess of 12. Since Legolas already has the Dagger Westerness, he'd go up to a 6, but he's feeling a little risky, so he's going to play a risky blow that would give him additional 3 prowess and tap. He would roll a 5, beating Bert, which would, since he beat him, he would gain the marshaling points and you would get to take the card, so they could no longer play it on you. You'd go on and move the Bert card into your out-of-play pile, and move your marshaling point counter up to 7. Don't forget to discard Risky Blow, since it's a short event, it only applies to one strike, so you cannot use it again on multiple strikes and multiple attacks. You'd have to play another one. Next, your opponent decides to play Orc Raiders, Key to Wilderness. This is an Orc attack with four strikes at six, so everyone has to take one. Gimli decides to take it first, since he's untapped. He decides, since he's already at a five, and at most roll a one to beat if he taps, so he decides not to tap and take the negative three modifier. So he rolls a five, getting a seven, beating the strike. So he's fine. Next, we're going to move on to Legolas. Legolas, since he's already tapped, he gets a minus one modifier. But since he gets a plus one for Dagger Westerness, he just goes right back up to five. He rolls a seven and also beats his strike. Now, Elodin will take the strike. He decides to follow Gimli's example and not tap, taking the negative three modifier. Unfortunately, he rolls a three and gets a five. So he's wounded. Now your opponent gets to roll, make a roll to see if he's eliminated. Fortunately for us, he rolls a six. So Elodin survives for now. Might be losing a little, some few fingers and stuff, but he's he's limping along. Now Pippin's going to take a strike since we don't want Pippin to die with his prowess of one. He's going to go on tap Elven Cloak to cancel his strike, which since it's keyed to Wilderness. Now your opponent decides not to go on and play his other Orc Warriors card and save it for your return trip, so he's more likely to kill you and make you lose more points. Now with the hazards out of the way. And you're now at the site. Now both players have to either discard or draw back up to eight cards. Luckily for both of you, you're already at eight, so you no longer have to worry about this. Now you have to worry about the automatic attack. You have to face, uh, face the automatic attack. You don't have to beat it. You just have to face it, nor will they actually get into the site to do anything. It's an undead automatic attack with one strike at a prowess of eight. You decide Gimli should take the strike, but since he cannot tap in order to play the card you want to play, he decides to play block, which means he does not have to tap. And he rolls a 6, added to his 5 prowess, makes 11, so he beats the automatic attack. With now that taken care of, they can go in the site and play their items. Gimli taps to play Hauberk of Bright Mail, and move your marshaling point counter up 2 from 7 to 9. Normally you tap the site once you play the item card, but since we're using a playmat, we don't have to worry about that. 
Normally, once you start playing with the real cards, you do have to tap, and you can only play minor items at the site once it's tapped, or unless the card says it can be played at a tapped site. And once you get back to Rivendell, you usually discard the card. But since we're, again, with Playmat, we don't have to worry about that. It makes it a heck of a lot easier. Now with this taken care of, both players have to either draw back up to 8 or discard back down to 8. Since you have 6 cards, you decide to draw Escape and Block. Your opponent has 8 cards already, but he's allowed to choose to discard one and draw another one instead. He decides to discard Orc Guard and draws Baragon. Now with that done, the turn is over and moves on to Gandalf's turn. To begin your opponent's first turn, his untap phase, since the first turn doesn't have to worry about it, the organization phase of his turn is next, so he wants to play Baragon but he does not have enough general influence to play him. So he decides to move Killy under Aragorn since Aragorn has enough direct influence to control him. Now he has enough general influence to play Baragon, but since Baragon isn't actually worth any marshalling points, he just kind of a meat shield for him. Now with his organization phase taken care of, he decides to go to Bree to play Rangers of the North. Now you get to have revenge for him wounding Eladon last turn. Since Bree is such a close sight, both of you only draw one card. You draw Brigands and your opponent draws Dark Quarrels. In order to get to Bree, your opponent has to move through two wildernesses, and once it gets to Bree, it's at a border hold. Now you're allowed to play f up to five hazards on him since he has five characters. Even though his hobbit is usually only worth half of a character, since he only has one, it still just counts as five. You begin by playing Wargs, a wolf attack with two strikes and nine prowess. Since all of his characters are untapped, he gets to choose who gets to take the strike. He decides to have Baragon take the first strike. She taps and rolls a seven making 11, so he beats the strike. Then he's going to have Boromir take another strike. He's going to tap him and rolls a 9, easily defeating the attack. Unluckily for you, that means he killed the wargs, and now he gets another marshalling point, moving him up to 7. Now you decide to play Wolves, which is another wolf attack, but it has 3 strikes at 8 prowess. And see, all he only has 3 characters left untapped. He decides to use Mary to tap and use Concealment, which carry and cancels the attack on their company. This is a good move since Mary is a weaker fighter than Killy. It's better to have him tap to use the Concealment than Killy would be. But since the attack's over, you now discard your hazard and he discards Concealment. Because he hid from your wolves, he, you decide to play another war, war card on him. Again, it's another wolf card that has two strikes and nine prowess. Since there's only two untapped, they have to take it. Since Aragorn and Killy, Killy decides to take it first. With the power of three, he decides to tap to face the wargs. And since he's not feeling that great, he decides to play Lucky Strike. This allows him to roll twice and choose the better roll of the two. He rolls a four and a six. Lucky for him, that six lets him tie the strike, but not kill it. So now it's Aragorn's turn. He decides not to tap since he's going to play, go on and play his Rangers of the North later this turn. So he takes the negative three modifier. But he decides to play Dodge, so he no longer has to worry about the modifier. And he rolls a 7, meaning he gets a 13 and defeats the strike. Unfortunately, since he Killy did not kill the strike, he does not get a marshalling point. And with that, that's the last hazard you can play on. You wish you could play Arouse Minions, but it only affects Shadow Holds and Dark Holds the company is moving through. Fortunately, he's only moving through a Border Hold, so it would do nothing. And you'd also like to play Ghosts, but none of its symbols match the site path of which they're going through. Since that, now they're over with moving, they're now at the site, they don't have to face an automatic attack, but you do have to draw back up to 8 and discard back to 8 if you're not there. You only have 5 cards, so you draw River, Halfling Strength, and Scroll of Seal Door. He only has 6, so he draws Saruman and Lesser Spiders. Now, since they're safe in the site, Aragorn's going to tap to play Rangers of the North. Playing a faction, you have to play at the site it says on the faction, and you also have to actually roll and beat the influence check in order to do it. You have to use your direct influence from the character and whatever modifiers a card or any other cards you give him. Unfortunately, he already has a follower Killy, so he's now at a zero, but he does get a modifier of plus two against Rangers of the North. And because he's a duodine, he gets a plus one modifier. Since he decides he still needs a little bit more help to beat the influence, he decides to play Tippering Friendship, which gives him an additional four, and he rolls a five, resulting in a 12, which is greater than the faction's nine mind. So he gets the faction and gets three additional marching points, pushing him up to ten. And if he failed the influence check, he would just had to discard the card. But he didn't, so he is now beating you in the game. With that, it's the end of his turn. You only have six cards, so you go decide to go on and draw Faramir and dodge. Your opponent draws nothing since he has eight and decides not to discard a card. Now it's your untap phase. Untap Gimli, Legolas, and Pippin's Elven Cloak. But since Eladan's still wounded and they're not at a haven, he stays wounded. 
Next, you'd like to play your wizard card, Saruman, but since you're not a haven, you're going to wait till next turn so you can play him with her all together. Since you've finished playing everything you can at the borrow downs, you decide to move back to Rivendell. Now you draw two cards, Ghouls and Halfling Stealth, and your opponent draws two cards as well, Lucky Strike and Eomer. Since you're moving back to Rivendell from borrow downs, the site path remains the same, two wildernesses and runes and lairs. Since you're technically still on the site when you're moving back, you can still play cards key to that site. It begins the assault by playing Brigands, a man attack with two strikes and eight prowess. Since three of your characters are untapped, you decide to have Gimli and Legolas take the strikes. We'll go on and begin with Legolas. Because he has five prowess plus one for his dagger to make him six, he decides not to tap to face the strike. And he rolls a six, totaling a nine, and beats the Brigands' power of eight. Gimli's going to take the next strike. He's not going to tap. He's going to play block so he doesn't have to get the modifier because his Hallberg of Brightman only adds to his body, not prowess like the dagger, and Gimli rolls a 10, easily defeating the strike. Since the Brigand is now out of play, you gain one marshalling point and put it in your marshalling point pile. Since orcs were so well against you last time, he decides to play orc warriors with three strike plus seven prowess. Since three of your characters are still untapped, each one of them has to face a strike. Because you don't want Pippin to end up like Eladan, you use his elven cloak to cancel his strike. Now Legolas will take his strike. Because you don't know if your opponent's going to play more hazards on you, you decide not to tap him and take the negative 3 modifier. Normally he'd go down to a 2 prowess, but since he has his dagger, he goes back up to 3. And he rolls a 4, with a total of 8, beating the strike. Next, Gimli also decides not, not to tap, because you don't know if there's any more things to be played on you. And he rolls 11, dominating the orc attack. But because Pippin cancelled his strike, he did not technically defeat the hazard. So you do not get the marshalling points for it, so the card is discarded. Now your opponent decides not to play any more hazards on you since the only thing he would have left is River, and that would not really apply since you're moving back to Rivendell and not a site, so it would be kind of worthless to play. Now since your movement hazard phase is over, both you and opponent have to go back to 8 cards, whether drawing back up to 8 cards or discarding back down to 8 cards. Since you have 9 cards, you decide to discard Halfling Stealth, since Pippin is doing fine with his Elven Cloak, doesn't need it, and your opponent has 8 cards, so he decides to do nothing. With that, you're back at the site. Luckily, since you only had one company move, it made it kind of easier. Usually the best thing would do is split up the companies, so you could actually send them to different sites to get different things at the same time, so it wouldn't take as long. But it would make it more dangerous and more likely to die, or you just have to send a rescue party to go bring back the wounded and limping characters you sent out. Now, since you don't have anything else to do, you decide to end your turn, and because you don't want to rouse minions in your hand anymore, you decide to discard it and draw Alina. Since your opponent still has eight, and does not want to discard, he does nothing. And now it is Gandalf's turn. Now since it's Gandalf's turn, he can untap all of his characters. Next he would like to play Faramir or Eomer, but he does not have enough general or direct influence to play him. The best thing for him to do would have been able to play his wizard card Gandalf, but he does not have it in his hand. If he did, he could have just played him at Rivendell, since your wizard can be printed on just at his home site or Rivendell. If he did have enough general influence, he could have just brought in the characters at Rivendell, as long as his wizard was not in the play. Since they're also done with their sight, they decide to move back to Rivendell. Because we're playing with starter movement, you remember, you still only draw the cards which says it on the sight card you're moving from the Haven. When you're going back to the Haven, you still draw the same cards from the sight you're moving from. So you only draw the amount of cards it says on the Haven when you're moving from Haven to Haven. Your opponent draws two cards, Gandalf and Great Shield of Rohan, and you draw two cards as well, Horan and Risky Blow. Now it's your turn to play Hazards. The sight path has two wildernesses and a border hold. Because of this, you can play Lesser Spiders, which has four strikes with a seven prowess. Because there's four strikes and all of his characters are untapped, he can choose any character to face the strikes. He chooses to use Aragorn, Boromir, Baragond, and Kili. Because he really wants those marshalling points, he decides to tap all of his characters to face them. Aragorn goes first with a four, easily defeating the strike with a ten. Boromir and Baragond go next, also tapping rolling a 7 and 9 respectively, and easily win. Because he doesn't feel Killy's confident enough to take it by himself, he decides to tap and play Lucky Strike, which allows him to roll twice and pick the higher roll of the two. Surpassing his expectations, Killy actually rolls a 10 and a 7, with both of them would actually easily defeat the strike. He decides to go for the 10 because he really hates those spiders. Because he squished those spiders to paste, he now gets additional marshalling point, moving him up 1, and he gets the card to put in his marshalling point pile. Next you play Hurin, an awakened plant with one strike at 10 prowess. Since Mary's the only one to untap, he has to face a strike. But luckily enough for him, and unlucky for us, he has Elven Cloak which cancels Horan and discards it. Now since you don't have any more playable hazards on him, he's now made it safely back to Rivendell. Since he made it back, both of you have to discard or draw back up to 8, 
He has nine cards, so he decides to discard Great Shield of Rohan. And because you have eight cards, you're just going to do nothing. Because he doesn't have anything to do or play at Rivendell, he decides to go on end the turn. And he decides to discard Eomer since he already has three characters and draw William. Because he's been going really only through Wilderness so far and you think that's where he's going to continue to go, you decide to discard Ghouls and draw Wolves instead. Now it's your turn again and you can untap Pippin's Cloak. And since Eldan kept hold of his severed fingers, he can now have them reattached at Rivendell. So he can move from Wounded to Tapped. And since your company is at a Haven, you now decide to refuel yourself and play your Saruman card. You'd also like to play Annalena. But since you can only play one character per turn, you go with the solid choice and choose Saruman. Since Saruman has 10 direct influence, you decide to reorganize your company so you can make more use of his direct influence. You make Legolas' follower, putting his card and the Dagger of Western Eyes under Saruman. This means you have 6 points of unused general influence and Saruman still has 4, so you're in good shape to play more characters or factions later in the game. Because you drew the Dunlending faction in your first turn, you decide to go on and move to Dunish Clan Hold to gain his 2 marshalling points. So you draw Wood Elves and Wolves, and your opponent draws Escape and Orc Guard. Your sight path from Rivendell to Dunish Clan Hold is 3 Wilderness and a Border Hold. But because you played Saruman, your opponent can now play up to 5 Hazards on you. He might not go up to that many, but it kind of makes it more hazardous for you the more characters you have going in a company. So you want to keep smaller companies that can take care of themselves whenever you're moving on a real game. First, your opponent plays William, who's a, a troll attack with one strike at 11, and he's kind of pissed that you killed Burke. So, Legolas is going to take the only strike and play Risky Blow, so he uh, gets an additional 3 bonus. He taps, so he stays at a 6, and he rolls a 5, reaching a 14, and kills William as well. With this, you go up to 11 marshalling points and put William in your marshalling point pile with the rest of the corpses. Luckily enough for you, he has no more creature cards. Unlucky for you, though, he plays River. With this card, he prevents you from playing or doing anything at the site unless you tap a ranger. But since Elanan's tapped, the only ranger you have left is Saruman. Because you wanted to use him to get the faction, it's going to be harder, but he's the only way you can actually do anything. So you decide to go on and tap him and use Gimli later for his faction. Now, since you're at the site, both you and your opponent, you normally would have to discard or draw back up to 8, but both of you have 8 cards, so you can go on and move on with the site phase. Since Mary's kind of worthless at influencing people, you decide Gimli should do it instead, so he taps to play Dunlendings. He has 2 influence, but unfortunately, he gets a minus 1 for being a dwarf. But, he decides to go on anyway and roll a 9, so he gets a 10 and gets the faction. With the two marshaling points you just gained, you go from 11 to 13, so you're in the lead right now. Now, since you're done with your turn, you decide to end, and since you only have seven cards, you draw a Rake of War, and your opponent discards a card, or guard, and draws Quick Beam instead. Now it's your opponent's turn, and get ready, this is going to be a long one. And since it's at the beginning, he untaps all of his characters and his items, and since he's finally back at a Haven, he decides to reveal himself as Grandolf the Grey. Now, since he has enough direct influence, he's going to put Mary and Boromir under his, his control along with their cards to be his followers. With this, his general influence moves back up to 9, and Gandalf still has two unused direct influence to use later. Now that that's taken care of, he really wants to play Scroll of Isildur to gain 4 marshalling points, so he needs to go to a site that can play the greater item. He only has Moria, Mount Gunnabad, or Dead Marshes, but in order to reach any of those places, he has to go to Lorien first. So, he draws Brigands and Concealment to move, and you draw Wargs and Lesser Spiders. And since he decided to move everyone to Lorien, you can play up to 6 Hazards on him, even if you don't have that many. It just gives you the rare chance to just obliterate him with whatever you have. But you can only play with 3 Wilderness and a Borderland to play on him. He doesn't know it yet, but you have Wake of War, Lesser Spiders, Wargs, and 2 Wolves just to eat him alive. So it's going to be a fun movement phase for him. You start off with playing Wake of War. This is a long event. A long event lasts from his turn where you play it through your turn and comes up at the beginning of his movement turn. So when you're moving on your own later, you want to make sure you either don't move or have something to take care of it and see him use the same card on you since it affects both of you. And the cool thing about this card, it increases the strikes and prowess of each wolf, spider, and animal attack by one. Two if, for wolves if doors and knights in play. But you do not currently have that card. So you can might use it later if you actually get it in your real play decks. And once this long event, like a lot of them, it says it cannot be duplicated. So you cannot 
double down on these things to do uber damage. It's kind of unfair doing that, so it's prevented. You begin your assault with wargs. A wolf attack normally at 2 strikes with 9 prowess, but thanks to Wake of War, goes up to 3 strikes at 10. He decides to choose Gandalf, Aragorn, Boromir to face the strikes. Gandalf happens to play dodge since he's a wuss and doesn't like to tap. He rolls a 5, defeating a strike. Boromir taps and rolls a 9, easily defeating his strike. And Aragorn taps and rolls a 7, defeating his strike. Unfortunately, he killed all the wolves, increasing his marshaling points to 12, and gained the card into his marshaling point pile. Normally, some long event cards or permanent event cards like this can only be taken off the board if they are defeated, like he did now with the wargs. But, lucky enough for us, Wake of War is a long event that stays on there till it comes up normally. Next, you decide to sick the wolves on him. Normally, it would be 3 strikes at 8, but since Wake of War is in play, it goes up to 4 strikes at 9. Things are starting to get a little tense for him since Boromir and Aragorn are already tapped. Because of this, he decides to play Concealment with Merry, tapping him. Concealment is a card that cancels the attack, but it has to tap a scout in order to do it. Scout is a type of skill on the character card, it's along with their race. It's right under the art frame. So a lot of these cards that require a certain skill, you want to make sure you keep up with which characters have them. Just like how you had to cancel River with Ranger earlier. With this, Wolves is discarded. And now you play another Wolves, just because you're kind of pissed off and you don't want him escaping. So this one is also at 4 strikes at 9 prowess to Wake of War. Things are getting even more tense with him, so he decides to take the coward's way out and play Escape. However, escape requires him to wound one of his characters. So he decides to wound Baragon since he's kind of a meat shield at this point. So wolves to discard it and they get away with him limping kind of badly. Now you're on your last hazard you can play on him. You're kind of irritated since he f just wussed out and canceled two of his attacks. But now with most of his characters tapped and Baragon wounded, these little boogers are the perfect thing to take care of him. They might be weak compared to other spiders, but these things will haunt Mary's nightmares for the rest of his life. Because he only has two left untapped or not wounded, Gandalf and Killy have to face two strikes. But since the others are tapped and wounded, you're allowed to choose who takes it. You decide to go with Boromir because he has a low body, Mary because he has a low prowess, and Baragon because he is wounded. To start off the assault, Gandalf taps and rolls an 8, defeating his strike. Mary takes the wuss way out and taps Elven Cloak to cancel his. Boromir, because he's feeling kind of testy, taps his shield to give a bonus 1 to his prowess of 6. And he rolls a 6, easily beating his strike. Killy taps and rolls a 4. That's not enough. He got wounded by the poison. So you now get the roll to kill and see if you can kill Killy. His body check is at a 8 normally. So you accidentally roll a 6 and you wound him. He loses a some blood and might get a little bit poisoned but he's still limping along. This leaves Baragon who rolls a three. Normally he has a five but since he's wounded, wounded character get a minus two modifier. So he wounded again. Let's see if we can actually kill them this time. You roll a ten and because it's greater than eight, Baragon is gone and dead. He is going to be put in his marshaling point pile with the rest of the corpses, and he can no longer be brought into play. Now you discard lesser spiders and give yourself a little pat on the back for finally killing somebody. Now since you have no more hazard to play on him, he's made it safety to the Lorien, well, more or less, and you now have to return back to eight, you and your opponent. You only have five cards, so you draw another Saruman, Gollum, and a Barrowite, and he draws two cards because he's at six, drawing a Orc Warriors and Escape. Because he's at a haven and has nothing really to do, he decides to discard Arouse Minions and draw Minion Stir to end his turn. Because you already have your wizard in play, you decide to discard the extra Saruman from your hand and draw a Halfling Strength. Now it's back to your turn. Now since it's your turn again, you can untap all your characters and items. You'd like to play Alina, but you're not at haven, so you have to wait till you get back next turn. Now since you're done with your work at Dunas Clanhold, you decide to go back to Rivendell. You draw two cards and he draws two cards. You draw Bard the Bowman and Arouse Minions and he draws his own Arouse Minions and a Gandalf. Your sight path is the same as it was before, three wilderness and a border hold. Since you're moving back to Haven, the Haven doesn't really count to be able to be played against you. But since he has Minion Stir and that doesn't really affect anything except for Orc Warriors, he decides to wait until next turn to play things on you. So you can make it back to Rivendell in one piece. You discard Bard the Bowman and escape to reach back to 8, and your opponent discards Gandalf from his hand and arouse minions to his hand to get back to 8. 
And since you're back at Rivendell and there's nothing you really can do, you decide to end your turn. Both you and your opponent are already at eight cards, and it moves on to its turn. This doesn't always happen, but it's a lucky for you, so you're less likely to die on your way back. But you don't get to discard any cards, so if you drew anything good and like stuff in your hand, you have to get rid of stuff that you don't want to. But usually only happens occasionally if they can't draw anything. Since he's now back at Rivendell, all of his characters except for Killy can untap. Hilly finally got his little antidote he needed, so he's recuperating, so he's moved back into tap position. Since he has a character to play and enough influence to play him now, he plays Faramir and his company under general influence, going up to 14 marshalling points. Because the Wake of War was playing play last turn, you go on and discard it. Now he can move. He has two things he can play, Scrolls of a Sealed Ore or Quick Beam. He decides to go with the higher marshalling point with Scroll of a Sealed Ore. Normally, you could split it in two companies and one go one way, one go the other. Since this is a starter game, we're just going to have it make it so we go in one company just so it's kind of easier for you to keep up with. So they decided to move to Moria, which is relatively speaking the safest out of the three options to go to. So he draws Dodge and Lucky Strike, and you draw Horn, Risky Blow, and Orcrist. Again, they're sticking to the wildernesses, so Moria from Lorien is two wildernesses and a shadow hold. And you can play up to four hazards on him. Because they're rather a superstitious lot, you decide to play ghosts on him, which is undeck attack at three strikes and nine prowess. Since he wants to, well, get over their fear, he chooses Gandalf, Aragorn, and Faramir to show them what for. Gandalf decides he doesn't want to tap and be the leader of the group and play dodge. He rolls a six and defeats his strike with a twelve. Aragorn decides to tap as well and roll 11, beating his strike, and Faramir taps also and rolls a 7, defeating his strike. They are able to pull their heads out of the dirt and kill, well, re-kill all the ghosts, getting an additional marching point moving up to 15, and putting the weird ectoplasm stuff for the remains into the out-of-play pile with the rest of the corpses. Now, since you're kind of irritated, they are able to pull it together and defeat their fears. You decide to play another horn on another awakened plant with one strike of ten prowess. Gandalf decides to pull up his belt and tap. Rolls an eight, defeating the plant, getting him up marshalling point, and giving them wood for the night's fire. Now you're extremely irritated, so you decide to bring out the big guns, the barrel white. An undead attack with one strike and twelve prowess. Boromir takes the strike, and he is feeling lucky, so he's playing lucky strike third roll twice and choose which one he wants to pick and he also taps his shield for a plus one bonus unfortunately for him he rolls a two and a four making the best of 11 and Bormir kind of lost a hand there so now we get to see if we can kill him and we roll an eight a body check normally he would result be eliminated but with the shield he gets a plus one body so he's an eight with that we tie his body he has to learn how to write with his left hand but he's walking away he would have died if he wasn't for that shield. As a side note, if we actually wound him again next turn, his body will actually go back to 7 since he gets a minus 1 modifier for being wounded. So that's very helpful if they're already wounded, but for now, we're just going to have to wait till next turn. After discarding Bar White, you decide to play Arouse Minions, which increases Moria's automatic attack from 7 to 10 in prowess. Since the movement hazard phase is over now, you both return back to 8. He draws Lambdring and you draw River. If you happen to have this earlier, you could have prevented him from actually doing anything, but we'll have to save that for later. Now that that's taken care of, they get to face the automatic attack you strengthened, but they take the worst way out and send Killy to divert them with escape. So while they're chasing Killy down the tunnels, Mary is going to tap and play Scroll of Sealed Door, gaining four marshalling points, moving them up to 20. Because your opponent reached the marshalling point cap we put on the game of 20, you have one more turn to try to beat him before it's game over. Because your opponent is not going to have any more time to play resources, he decides to discard his Halfling Strength and draw Orc Raiders, Riders of Rohan, and Urkenbrand. And you decide to discard River and draw Celeborn to try to get more Marshland points. It's now your turn. All your people are already untapped. And since it's, you only have 13 Marshland points, you need at least 20 to tie your opponent. And since we're training with a level cap, if you can at least reach 20, that would mean you'd have another turn to, for him to try to get more, and then you'd have another turn. It just goes until it goes through one turn and you're not beating him anymore. Usually the only ways to win is either kill your opponent's wizard, and then the game's automatically game over for them. Or you get Gollum and the one ring to Mount Doom and sacrifice him, then the game's over. Or you can go through your play deck once and call the free council. By doing this, it's the same thing as how we're doing now. Your opponent gets one turn to try to get more Marshland points to you. 
or tie you to continue the game to stay as a stalemate. But if they don't, that means you win. Now let's see if we can get you to win this game from the jaws of defeat. Now that you have enough general influence, you can play a character, but you can only play one, so you decide to use Kelleborn, who's worth more at two Marsling points. It brings your total up to 15. Now you need to go to a site so you can play more items to get more resources. Luckily, you have three resources to play, Wood Elves, Orcris, or Gollum, but Gollum's the only one you don't have to go to Lorien to go get. So you decide to go get him at Goblin Gate. So you draw one card, block, and your opponent draws two cards, Orc Guard and Minion Stir. And the site path from Rivendell Goblin Gate is two wildernesses with a shadow hold at the site, so your opponent can play up to five hazards on you. This is going to be rough. Begins by playing Minion Stir. This is a long event that increases the number of strikes and prowess of each orc control attack by one. Since this is a long event, you can't get rid of it by just defeating one of their attacks. You're going to have to deal with it the rest of the turn. He begins his assault by using orc guards to attack you. It normally has five strikes and with eight prowess, but since it's an orc attack, it goes up to six strikes with nine prowess. This would be really tough for Pippin since he cannot use his cloak to hide since it's in a shadow hold. So you decide to use dark quarrels to cancel attack and get it discarded. Next, your opponent plays Orc Raiders. Normally at 4 strikes with 6 prowess, it goes up to 5 strikes with 7 prowess. Since you have 6 characters, Pippin does not have to take it. Eldan taps and rolls a 6, defeating his strike. Gimli plays Block, so he doesn't have to tap, and rolls a 9, defeating his strike. Kelleborn doesn't tap, getting a negative 3 modifier, but rolls a 7 and defeats his strike. Legless decides also not to tap, rolls a 10, squashing his attack. And Saruman doesn't tap with another modifier, rolls a 5, and just defeats his attack. Since you're able to kill the Orc Raiders, you get their Marshalling Point and move their card into the Marshalling Point pile. Your opponent sends even more Orcs their way with Orc Warriors. Normally at 3 strikes with 7 prowess, but with Minion Stir, it goes up to 4 strikes with 8 prowess. You choose Gimli, Caliborn, Legolas, and Saruman to take the strikes. Gimli taps and rolls a 5, defeating his strike. Caliborn decides not to tap and takes the negative modifier, rolling a 9 and defeating his. Legolas also decides not to tap, rolls a 6, and kills his orc. Saruman decides to tap and rolls an 8, easily defeating his strike. And with this, they kill the last orc and gain another marshalling point, moving the bodies into the pile, going up to a nice 17. With that amazing display of physical prowess, your opponent realizes that most of your people are still untapped, and then sending you more hazards your way would just be giving you marshalling points. So he decides to pass the turn so you can go on and move into the site. Now, before you can face automatic attack or do anything, both of you have to go back up to 8. So since you're at 6, you draw Sword of Gondolin and Tempering Friendship, and your opponent draws Orc Watch and River. And now you're in the site to face the automatic attack. Unfortunately, Minion Stir is still in play, and it applies to automatic attacks as well. So the automatic attack is up to a 4 strike with 7 prowess. You have 3 untapped characters with Pippin, Celeborn, and Legolas each taking a strike, and your opponent chooses Elidan to take the 4 strike. Kelleborn plays Risky Blow to add 3 prowess, so he doesn't have to tap, so he goes back to his normal prowess. He rolls a 4 and defeats his strike. Now Legolas taps to take his strike. He rolls a 9, devastating the orc that he was attacking. Pippin taps and rolls a 6, tying his strike, surprisingly with his short stature. Eldan is already tapped, so he takes a negative 1 modifier to his prowess. Unfortunately, he rolls a 2 and is wounded. Your opponent has to make a roll to try to kill him. Luckily for us, he rolls a 7 and he is not eliminated. Now that you're done with the automatic attack, you can tap to play Gollum. Normally, Celeborn, since he's the only tapped character, would play him. But you have halfling strength, so you can untap Pippin, and Pippin taps to play Gollum. Place Gollum's card under Pippin's control. This increases your marshalling points to 19. And as another side note, whenever you play an ally, the person that played it, or it's connected to, it has to stay with them. It cannot be transferred like normal characters. And so if they die or corrupted, the card gets discarded. They don't die, they just go into the discard pile, but you still lose the marshalling points. And your opponent, at sometimes when they're at another same site you are, they can try to influence the ally away, just as they can with an item or a faction. They just have to be there, and it's easier to do with the card that you have. But, that's the rest of your turn. So you draw Lesser Spiders, Halfling Strength, and River, and your opponent has 8 cards and does nothing, and this is the end of the game. And the only thing left to do is count out the marshalling points and see who won. Now we'll go on and tally up the scores, reading off what cards give how many marshalling points to each player. Starting with Gandalf, with Aragorn, has three marshalling points, Bormir has one, Killy one, Mary one, Faramir two, Ranger of the North three, 
Scroll of the Sealed Door 4, Wargs 1, Lesser Spiders 1, another Wargs 4th 1, Ghosts is 1, and Horn is 1. So Gandalf ends with the game with a total of 20 Marshland points. Now for your points, you get 2 Marshland points for Gimli, 2 for Legolas, 1 for Eladan, Pippin's 1, Celeborn is another 2, Dunlinsing's 2, Hallberg of Bright Mail is 2, Gollum is worth 2, Burt is worth 1, Bergen's 1, William won, Orc Raiders won, and Orc Warriors won. So in the game, you end with 19 points, and with Gandalf having 20, one more than you, Gandalf wins the game. The major factors for him winning are primarily the scroll of Isildur and you not being able to actually kill any of his, mar his men that were worth any Marshland points. Under normal circumstances, you would have split your companies in two and sent them out to get more items at the same time. This would make things much quicker than how the starter would game go. But with this, the best thing you probably can do is just take these two decks or two of the challenge decks on the rest of the site and just play through them yourself, see how how well you do. It, this game takes practice and kind of strategy to figure out how you want to want to go and which things to do. This game does require somewhat luck on what you draw and just whether or not your opponent can kill you or pull and draw his own cards in the right manner. And this, my friends, is goodbye. That's the end of the starter set game. Hopefully I can, as I said earlier in the video, I'll add more and more to the site as I go on since it's just been a project I've always wanted to work on. So there's just not that many of them online. So you can't find these cards anymore. But hopefully I'll end up adding a discussion board and get your feedback on this and just general way to get people interested in this game again. And again, I've placed all the play mats and the rules and the starter set, everything you need to be in on the site for downloads so you can either print them out on home or just go to some place and get them printed nicely but also have their challenge deck so if you want have a more adventurous and unknown trip try to get one of the starter sets to play with just remember if you're playing with a you can't play against a it has each person needs a different deck there are five hopefully eventually i'll put on the ring wraith decks and balrog deck as well hopefully i'll depends on if i get around to doing it or not but hopefully you enjoy it and i hope you enjoyed this trip Tell your friends about the game. Hope you enjoy it. And remember, it's been a very long trip together, but well worth it in the end if you enjoy it and learn how to play. And remember to check the Wizard's Journey site for more updates to come. It might be far in between, but it's going to be well worth it in the end. And I'll go on and leave you guys with one of my favorite quotes from the books.